Good evening and welcome to Thames River Heritage Park's Stories in the Park. This is our second six-part lecture series that's being offered at this beautiful, is this not a beautiful location, thanks to the Lyman Allen Art Museum and the hard work of Eileen Donovan, who's been doing all the prep work for these lectures. So we give Eileen a big thanks. And to Gail McDonald, our lecture series chair, who has put all these lectures together, coordinated with all the speakers and worked to bring you all here tonight. So thank you. We are very grateful to both of them and to all of you for being here with us. I don't know how many of you are intimately familiar with Thames River Heritage Park, but Thames River Heritage Park is a state park, and it's a collection of the heritage sites on both sides of the Thames River in the city of New London, the city of Groton, and the town of Groton. And that includes the Lyman Allen Art Museum, the Guard Art Center, the Hempstead Houses, the Nathan Hale Schoolhouse, the Old Town Mill, Pequot Chapel, Cedar Grove Cemetery, many, many more in New London, the Monte Cristo Cottage, and then the Avery Cop House Museum in, in Groton, along with Fort Griswold, Fort Trumbull, the Ebenezer Avery House, and a, many other 20 heritage sites along the Thames. And then we have institutional partners who are also committed to preserving the history and heritage here. Our job, I'm with the Thames River Heritage Park Foundation. Did I tell you my name already? I am Catherine Foley. I am the executive director of the Thames River Heritage Park Foundation. And our job at the foundation is to promote, support, sustain, and connect the heritage sites on both sides of the Thames. Many of you may have heard of, hopefully you've all ridden on the water taxi. That water taxi is there to connect both sides so that people can come up and visit the heritage sites on both sides very easily. Come down to New London or the Thames Street in Groton or to Fort Trumbull and hop on on a Saturday and Sunday and tour around the sites. We also have some really wonderful, I'm, I'm a little prejudiced, but really wonderful narrated historic boat tours done by Gail and many other um, subject matter experts from the, from the community who do some great tours on the Thames during the summer. We hope you will come and enjoy, enjoy some of them with us. Kara uh, is also on. Um, yes. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm doing double duty tonight. I will also be sitting over here in case Lisa needs any support throughout this, but I'm Really pleased tonight to introduce Lisa Hall Brunel. Lisa is a fiction writer and editor who believes that stories have the power to connect one person to another and the past to the present. She was born in New London, attended Williams School and graduated from Brown University. Two years later, Lisa earned her MA in English with a concentration in creative writing from San Francisco State University where she edited a literary magazine called Transfer. A few years later, as a newspaper reporter, she worked as a writer and editor for the nonprofit organizations, including the Mystic Seaport Museum. As former director of publications for Conn College, she edited the award-winning Connecticut College Alumni Magazine for 20 years and produced everything from annual reports to coffee table books. Her historical novel, Gavel's Road, was published by Elm Grove Press in 2022 and has been featured in Kirkus Review, the Historical Novel Review, and Connecticut Magazine. She is working on her second novel, a collection of short stories. And I have to read you a comment before Lisa gets up from someone on Facebook when I posted this event on my page. I went to Lisa's first reading. She captivated you right from the start. It is my pleasure to introduce Lisa um, now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. And thank you to Gail McDonald and to my friends at Lyme and Allen, um, especially Eileen Anderson and uh, Eileen Donovan and Ellen Anderson. Many, many years ago, I heard a story that I couldn't forget. It was about a young woman named Sarah Bramble, an indentured servant 
who was charged with the murder of her newborn infant. She was arrested, um, in, jailed for almost 20 months, put on trial, um, put on trial twice, because at that time, court, the Superior Court only met once a year, and eventually executed in the area now known as Gallows Lane. After, of course, I wrote my novel, Gallows Road, because I couldn't get this story out of my mind, and I wanted to answer as many questions as possible. But even after years of thinking about it, um, there's still many unknowns to me. But one thing I do know is that tonight, all of us, we are at the epicenter of that story. I know I've described to some of you how Sarah Bramble was taken by a horse-drawn cart uh, to the gallows under armed guard. There were 26 soldiers and thousands of people. But um, her last moments were coming up Bulls Hill in New London. Now, you might say, where's Bulls Hill? Well, we are sitting right on top of Bulls Hill right now, the museum. That is where we are placed. So this is kind of a special night for me. And in, in, uh, it's exciting, but also sort of strange to be so close to that, the center of my story. But uh, I'm going to start with about a five minute reading from the book because it explains a lot. We, we hear from my fictional character, Mercy Bramble. She is based in as much as possible on Sarah Bramble. And the year is 1753. We are in the colony of Connecticut. She is reciting a nursery rhyme that she learned as a child. Mercy Bramble is my name. England is my nation. New England is my dwelling place and Christ is my salvation. The childish lines I used to recite were nonsense to me now, neither truth nor lie, yet they kept repeating in my head as though the words could tether me to this world for another day. I, Mercy Bramble, had looked ahead to a life of many days, not just one, but because of all of you, this was to be my last night on earth. You'd taken everything from me by then. You'd even taken my name and twisted it into something evil a bramble weed that chokes other living things. Worst of all, you'd taken away my dream of ever knowing true freedom. Like a doomed ship striking rocks, a northern gale slammed the prison walls over and over. The wind had crossed many miles of cold Atlantic waters to reach New London shores. I used to love the wind when I was a small girl. Now it was hard to believe that I once was such a person, that timid little Mercy Bramble who lived as a servant at the Holtz farmhouse and slept in their attic. Hearing the wind rage above her always made that little girl feel so safe from harm. Now, as I crouched in the dark without a single candle, I didn't know whether to weep like a child or suffer in silence like a martyr of the scriptures. What was the use in pretending that I was safe anymore? After living as a prisoner for so many months, I'd almost forgotten my former life as a servant. The never ending duties from those days seemed pointless now, how I kept the hearth fire going from dawn to dusk, even in the blazing heat of summer. It was silly to think of it, but Faith, the sheriff's short, plump wife, had become a kind of servant to me, the actual prisoner. Occasionally she washed my garments, I, um, and loaned me baggy things of her own, while my ragged gown and shift were dried on bushes by the lane. Never had I felt so naked, knowing that all of you, especially you men, could see my clothing spread out on display. I suspected that my youth and appearance gave Faith more cause to despise me than the crime with which I'd been charged, or the sin I'd committed before that. It's colder than the devil's heart in here, she'd complained to me one evening. Her tone was reproachful, as though I were a miserly innkeeper who kept my hearth cold and allowed my guests to shiver. When she'd said the same thing to me before, I'd always turned away, rolling my eyes. I wondered why older people liked to repeat themselves. Did they think that we younger ones really weren't listening? In months past, I would have answered her with a touch of impudence. So just let me out of here, you silly old woman. You wouldn't have to wait on me anymore or mind this hearth. Or better yet, why don't you open a window so I don't have to smell your stench anymore? 
There were no windows, of course, and I couldn't have summoned any strength to crawl through one anymore. My life had been short, but I learned one lesson well. People were not always as they seemed, and they could change from day to night. That proved true again when Faith appeared, returned much later that evening, carrying an armload of dry kindling to light my fire, and as always, a bowl of boiled potatoes. My husband's fast asleep already. Even a sheriff has to close his eyes sometime, but who knows what a prisoner could do when no one is looking. She lifted her apron and showed me a set of keys tucked into her bulging waistband. And look, the door, it's wide open. How careless of me. She laughed like a nervous young girl. Yet I hadn't been able to walk through that door that night, suspecting that her offer had only been a kind of trick. Once I'd been such a strong young woman, but I'd been fasting for days now. My strength was gone from my body and my mind. All earthly matters were fading, slipping away inch by inch like a dry snakeskin. Hope was growing thin and slipping away as well. I saw no way that I could escape into the darkness of the woodlands. The pathways leading away from New London across rivers to the east and to the west were for others to travel, not for Mercy Bramble. All of you had determined my route and chosen my destination. I would begin my journey the next morning, but I still had one long night left ahead of me to reflect and to remember. And so I did. So that's the way it opens. And from that point, we flash back to her life as a child when like quite a few children, she was indentured at age seven, which means she was pretty much left by her mother and signed on for uh, seven years. So. Um, so who was Sarah Bramble? We, um, we know her often by the negatives. Um, she was probably and most certainly illegitimate herself. She was definitely illiterate. She had not been taught to read or to write, although she learned some reading when, during her long imprisonment. She was unbaptized, which is probably even worse because that made her a total outcast in a society where church and state were entirely one. So you had very few rights and could not attend church services if you hadn't been baptized. And in some cases, you couldn't be baptized if you didn't have a father. So it was, <laughs> she was caught in quite a, a catch-22. She was also an indentured servant. And um, some people have said to me, oh, don't call her indentured you know, that sounds so boring to say that she's a servant. And I said, well, it's, it's really very important what her state was and that we understand uh, that entire institution. I, I'm going to read some excerpts from a typical uh, certificate of indenture. And these are direct quotes from some from the Northeast. So and this was the contract that you might enter into or your parent might, might sign for you. Your master and mistress ye shall faithfully serve for seven years. Their secrets ye shall keep close. At cards or dice ye shall not play. Fornication ye shall not commit. Matrimony ye shall not contract. Taverns, alehouses, or places of gaming ye shall not haunt. As your master, I agree to provide meat and drink, washing, lodging, and education in the scriptures. After serving seven years, I will provide two good suits of clothes, one for Sunday and the other for work. So, you know, if you were starving and on your last shilling or an orphan, this was a very, this was a career opportunity, but it depends on how you look at it. There was one more thing they did, and I'm curious about the time, but they would take these two identical documents and they would tear or cut them in a pattern that was unique to this. I'll see if I can do it the way I've seen them do it. <laughs> Should have practiced more. And then you each took part of the, the contract and because you had no other way to duplicate it. And this is the, the, the term indenture, on dawn, but the teeth that would fit together. And then you could prove in case somebody forged or changed the dates on your, on your indenture. So that's 
just something I learned that started apparently in the Middle Ages, but I saw that in a lot of, you know, 1600 documents. So, okay, so let's start this journey um, of mainly things that inspired me with the landmarks that we can associate with Sarah Bramble. And many of them are from Thames River Heritage <laughs> Park. So um, we will jump forward. Let's see. No, no, it's not moving. Not to the right. No, it's not moving. Whoops. Oh, just that area. Okay. A Google map of, of Gallows Lane. I was talking to quite a few of you who were very familiar with it and also lived in this area for quite some time. Now, I just printed this and I was surprised to see this, what to me is an imaginary road called Bulls Lane. This actually appears on the Google map. It's a wide path. You know, it's uninhabitable and it's certainly, you cannot drive on it. Um, I hope you can all see, of course, that this is Connecticut College over here. We're just out of the picture. Gallows Lane, it's not much more than half a mile long, and it twists and turns, and then there's one road that goes off in the other direction. It's named for the Bowles family, who first settled there in the mid-1600s, and Thomas Bowles, but um, that would have been the actual crossroad where, where Sarah Bramble was executed, and there was a long-standing British tradition to execute people at a crossroad, one of those there's numerous superstitions, but also no one wanted to execute a murderer on their own property, so they had to remove it away from other people. The crossroad, no one actually owned the road, so that is um, part of the, the reason there. Um, well, also meant originally, supposedly, this land was sold from the son of Uncas to the Bowles family. So we, you know, I don't have the details on that, whether it was a sale or, yes. Well, I just wondered if that map is north, north? Yes, north, old Norwich. Uh, it's roughly, roughly seems to be the right direction. Yep. Ah, now it's my bu little buttons working. This is the path. And um, I frequently walked along it. It's not in the most, all of this is within the Connecticut College Arboretum, but um, this one, you know, the trees aren't labeled and so forth. It's a little, it's a little rougher. It's called the Goodwin Track, but um, the any eyewitness reports were about how rocky the road was on the, um, on the final ascent to the highest point in the road. And let's see. And the date was, of course, November 21st, 1753. And I like to jump into the picture. You know, <laughs> where's Waldo? In case you're interested, that's the, get, the gate. It says no jogging. It's not much of a parking spot. You probably would not be safe parking there. But you could walk from William Street or wherever you park to go to the, to the Arboretum. But um, I picked a very dreary day to, to go. All right, and this we probably all know very well, the, the Hempstead House. The reason it inspired me is because Joshua Hempstead is very much a player in this drama. Of course, he was the man about town. He kept a journal for 47 years, at least. And um, he was justice of the peace. He was the man to see if you needed a gravestone, um, just, just about everything. And he was also called to investigate the day that um, they that her infant died and so he rode out to the house where she was living so um, and we'll we'll see pages from his diary in just a minute I just included this just to this would have been Sarah Bramble's whole world if you know running a uh, keeping a, a hearth going at all time and okay we I included Waterford Beach because I was <laughs> born in New London. I grew up in Waterford and I feel I grew up on this beach. Mm -hmm. So I've included several scenes in the in the book that take place there. The, the, the main character, of course, is a teenage girl. And one day she and another servant kind of tricked the master and mistress so that they could go down to the beach and look for clams and so forth. But it also ties in with um, a story that I'll just very briefly tell you about. Is anyone here familiar with the story of the Spanish ship affair? 
Okay, good. That's I, I find it absolutely fascinating. But it was a shipwreck that occurred at about exactly the same time that um, Sarah Bramble was in prison. I mean, the two things overlapped, and it was something the town was extremely excited about. A disabled Spanish ship uh, was wrecked not far, more off of Pleasure Beach area. But one of the, and it was loaded with gold and silver and doubloons and tons of precious indigo. One of the things that apparently happened was as the ship was starting to sink, uh, a pure white horse was completely dyed blue as the indigo washed through the decks as the ship was sinking. But a crew member let it, let it off and uh, it was described as found running up and down a long beach. And I, I had the feeling it must have been Waterford Beach at that time. So that horse pops up a few times in the story because I just couldn't resist. That's the type of thing that the, one of those thousand stories that you can, can see from. And I'm just, this is a, a map of that area from really 70 years later. And I just thought it was interesting that those beaches are not labeled in any way. The rocks are important, the navigation, but a beach itself was useful, useless to the to the colonists. You know, you couldn't graze animals there, you couldn't plant it. So, um, but at the same time, I that my character really has a connection to the ocean and wants to wants to see it, even though she lives only a few miles away. And they would have been very amused at our habit of going, taking chairs and blankets and just sitting on a beach and doing nothing all day. <laughs> we probably would have been sent to the pillory. Another familiar scene, and also very important to me. For a while, I thought this, of course, is uh, really right in the middle of New London, close to the Magnet School and the Greek Church. But for quite a while, I thought that Sarah Bramble had to be buried here. And it finally uh, dawned on me or came to light that her infant is probably buried here in a pauper's grave. But as a condemned criminal, she would not have been allowed to be buried here. So she is not there. She is probably buried on Gallows Lane, very close to the place where she was executed because she did ride on her coffin that day. So, but I still visited here several times and looked at all the names and started to learn again, a lot of the history and the, and there I am again, just checking it out. So it's one, how many people have visited that, that graveyard at some time? It's just fantastic. I know Barb. <laughs> so, um, quickly, this is the some of the graves of the Christopher's family, and they come up also in the story because the sheriff who imprisoned Sarah Bramble and took her to her execution was named Christopher Christopher's, which sounds like something out of Winnie the Pooh, <laughs> but, um, and I'm sure he's a very nice man, but um, he was descended. These are some other family members. Apparently he does not have a gravestone, which is not so unusual. And again, I've been told many of these markers were put up 50 or even 100 years after the person died, because that's how long it took the family to raise the money to, to have one and to put it in. So it really is a jumble. But this one, I think, is Peter Christopher's. He might have been the son, I think, of um, Christopher Christopher's. And I can't resist also very briefly. <laughs> if you Google Christopher Christopher's, you're probably going to see an ancestor of the sheriff who was also called Christopher Christopher's. And he was one of the first settlers in New London, um, a mariner. There was a Christopher's Wharf name for him. But he's kind of infamous in the material that comes up. He was charged with having an affair with a, a widowed lady. And he himself was married. Um, and that widowed lady had two children. So they were both charged with adultery. But in the end, only she was punished. She was, I think she had, you know, the 15 pound fine, something like that. And she had to wear a hat with a very outrageous uh, saying on it. So it was very much like the, uh, the Scarlet Letter, but it happened right here. And I, that is kind of amazing looking back at that, but there were at least three or four Christopher Christophers. So. And I just like that name, of course, you know, for the, oh, here we go again, I'm trying to, there we go. And Benedict Arnold does not appear in this book, except in the epilogue, because this was, you know, 30 years before the burning of New London. But um, that's his other connection to that. Is, I don't know whether it's a, a hearsay or not, but he was said to watch the burning of New London from his horse, 
standing in that ancient burial ground. So it was a good vantage point. And he is kind of my villain because if it hadn't been for him, we probably would have a lot more documents and information and journals that, that had not been destroyed. He also lived in Norwich. And at the time I calculated was 12 years old. Supposedly every man, woman, and child within 20 miles or 30 miles, according to Joshua Hempstead, was at this execution. So it's possible that he was there because children were brought to these executions to hear the sermon and um, to, you know, to be to be instructed. So it's possible. He, let's see. And now we're down on State Street. I'm looking at the time. Um, Timothy Green also plays a part in my book and the real story of Sarah Bramble because he printed some of the sermons that were preached before and after her her execution. So. And he was the one who, you know, founded the first newspaper, but that wasn't until about eight years after. So again, we were in an area with no, no newspaper, no firsthand reports. And that's another thing that just makes it kind of, kind of a mystery. This is, of course, the plaque in the sidewalk. This is the, the house that he ran his business in. That, that uh, rental sign is now gone. I just went out to check it the other day. But I've always wondered about it because that looks like something out of Shakespeare's England and it's totally, totally out of place. How could that be? It's because he brought it from another location. It really was a much older house. So it was probably brought here on a ship, reassembled, and it's by far the oldest building. I know. It's like all these little funny things come to light. It's on State Street. State Street. Yeah. But he appears in it because, uh, um, well, you'll see, for those of you who read the book, he, uh, Timothy Green plays an important part because he really was one of the few people to document her, her uh, case. This appears only for just very briefly. And, and um, Winthrop, John Winthrop the Younger created this mill. It was a, one of the first commercial buildings in New England. So my characters, of course, have to bring corn to this mill. But I also noticed that he was a, all very shrewd businessmen. He had it, you know, created into law that absolutely no one else could have a mill. So if you wanted old McDonald's mill across the street, forget it, it was actually forbidden by, by law. So let's see. We are. Oh, this is an unusual house, and I'm afraid there are no historic plaques on it. <laughs> but like every writer, you're influenced by your own background. And this is the house that I grew up in in Waterford. Um, it, it was, we were told it was pre-revolutionary. My parents bought it in the 1950s. But um, I'm definitely influenced by knowing what it felt like to live in a house that had fireplaces. You know, we had heat, we had running water, but the water came from that old well. And it was not very deep. So I envied all the neighbors who had artesian wells. I thought that was the greatest thing in the world because a few times in the summer, our well went dry. So again, that's an episode that I used in the book, what it was like when the farmer's wells ran dry. And apparently some of the droughts were as bad as the ones uh, that we have today. And believe it or not, back in the early sixties, we still burned trash because so that made me feel very, very old. So. <laughs> All right, a little sturdier building. This is the Connecticut State Library. And um, again, very grateful for our tax dollars at work because the archives are absolutely incredible. There's a museum of Connecticut history that's you know, quite small, but, but fascinating. And the archives have every single record of every Superior Court case going back as far as you can into the, to the mid 1600s. So that is where someone had said, well, haven't you gone to find her death warrant? And I said, no, I haven't done that, but this is quite a few years ago, found her death warrant there and the papers from uh, which I will show you all here in the uh, State Library. Now they'll send you, I did visit there in person, but now they'll send you you know, JPEG files and so forth and photocopies. But, and this is why it's so hard to do the research. Everything was written by hand. Every inch of the paper is covered because paper was so precious. Um, the case itself, and she did have two cases. I only really seriously looked at the second one. It was in September of 1752 and 1753. During the rest of that time, she was just rotting in jail all of that time, waiting for her trial to come up. 
but of course the Rex V Sarah Brown, the Rex is George the second. So sometimes we forget, you know, <laughs> that we were not in our, in our own era, but it says Sarah Bramble was guilty of the murder uh, and her, in it, her, you know, her sentence there. So the, the case that came up that same day before it was for a man who'd committed blasphemy. Apparently in public, he had used the name of the son of God in vain. And he was sentenced to a public whip thing with 20, 20 lashes. So, but um, this is her actual death warrant, also from the Connecticut State Archives. Um, and, you know, that she was, you know, that she was to be hung between heaven and earth. Um, the other one. This is something that really, this little piece of paper is something that was just very powerful and meaningful to me. This, and, and I, when I visited the state library, it was quite a few years before COVID. And for some reason or other, I was allowed to handle these documents individually and to hold this in my hand, the actual note from Christopher Christopher's swearing that he had executed her, that he caused, uh, said Sarah to be hanged up between the heavens and the earth on the 21st day of November between the hours of 11 o'clock before noon and three in the afternoon by the neck until she was dead. Christopher Christopher. So it just gave me chills. And at that point, I knew I just wanted to learn more and, and write a book about her because she had been, you know, passed over. These also look very familiar. They're probably the most popular sources I used. And definitely each one of them has a thousand stories in it. So many of the smaller plots in the book are come straight out of mentions in Joshua Hempstead or uh, Francis Calkins, who wrote, wrote her history in 1850. But this is a close up. Um, Patricia Schaefer at the um, New London County Historical Society allowed me to see the exact page where Joshua Hempstead wrote about that he had ridden out to see her execution. And again, this was a big thrill for me also because I'd been handling other, you know, other documents, but, um, and this, well, I'll read it from the other thing, but I thought it was unusual that he shows no emotion whatsoever. He's no emotion, but he's very exacting. But I did think it was funny that he did this funny little doodle here. And I didn't see that any other place. So there was just a little whimsical or maybe later he realized that this was an important day. Um, there had not been that many executions at, at that point. So, but, um, and he had been present several times and also attended some of the trials, most of which were by candlelight at night. And people were too busy to go to court during the day. They're so busy farming and staying alive that court was held by candlelight. So, And well, this is the, again, the, the passages that say that there were 10,000 people in attendance there. And that has been disputed. That might be like us saying a zillion, but overall, he's a very exacting man. And I do believe it's possible, but the entire population of New London was only 3000 at that time. So, and he came to the cross highway above uh, Joseph Bowles, which is where we are now, just to see Sarah Bam Bramble executed for the murdering of her bastard child in March last was a year since. And to the crowd of spectators of all sexes and nations that are among us from the neighboring towns, as well as this, I judged it to be 10,000. So that is quite the scene. And again, recently, I just learned that there were th 36 soldiers hired by the sheriff. And I hadn't seen any other mention of that. So she was under armed guard on the way. And she also had a minister riding along with her who tried to preach his, her last statement. And apparently he was, you know, physically abused and pulled out of the car and beaten. And in his statement, he said, I will not pollute the mind of the reader by saying the, the names that I was called. So this was a wild scene, a wild scene. It was, uh, and I just wanted to include who Francis Manwaring Calkins is, because again, very indebted to her. I mean, I'm sure, you know, sometimes she, uh, let's see, not glossed over things, but there were certain things that probably were just too delicate for her to mention. So, 
but she did did us all a great service. And I think she was one of the first women to ever be admitted to a historical society. And, and just a tip of the hat to Jonathan Edwards, when I was in high school, I had a high school English teacher who would recite the, um, the original sermon for sinners in the hands of an angry God. And people have, were still influenced by this. Um, the Great Awakening was a huge event in New London, and it was only about 10 years beforehand, but there was a great deal of religious fanaticism at that time, and all the famous preachers like Jonathan Edwards uh, were able to, to preach. So, um, I just want to read one little excerpt from that because I remember it from high school. So, oh sinner, consider the fearful danger you are in. It is the great furnace of wrath wide and bottomless pit full of the fire of wrath. You hang by a slender thread with the flames of divine wrath flashing about it with nothing to lay hold of, nothing that you can do to induce God to spare you one moment. And I think that a lot comes through in, in the, uh, the zeal to punish Sarah Bramble, uh, I think who was, became a scapegoat for this. So, And let's see. This is just one little portion of the, the text published by um, Timothy Green. And again, the, the typeset version is very rare. And this is a quote from a minister that was also published by Timothy Green. They loved to print the sermons afterward. It was called Gallows Literature and often was sold at the gallows. Um, this was custom began in England and it was, you know, continued in the United States. So I didn't know about any of this until I started researching it. But he said of her, "'Twas observed by several impartial spectators that though she was a woman fair to look upon, which no doubt was a snare to her innocence, yet on that fateful day, an uncommon luster, sprightliness and joy sparkled on her countenance. So it was a, uh, I thought it was sad because in a way it was the only kind word anybody I saw ever written about her, but um, that he was, of course, indirectly blaming her because she was a, a pretty girl. And again, she was possibly as young as 15 or 16, but that was not noted. So, And let's see, very quickly, just in case, to give you some idea, you're probably thinking, well, how many people were executed? Not as many in New London, but this just shows just two centuries. I, I'm not going to put all four. And this information is also from the Connecticut State Library. But in the 1600s, you know, maybe 30, 40 people, the whole witchcraft era, which started in Connecticut, I know you can't read this like a but, you know, the 11 people were executed for witchcraft, 10 women and one, one man. Um, but other causes of murder, um, causes of execution, murder, bestiality, blasphemy, pederasty, murder and witchcraft. And that went on for, for quite some period. So, but Sarah Bramble is more or less about the 40th person to be executed. And there were two other women from New London who were fairly famous also, Catherine Garrett and uh, Hannah Akish, Hak Akowish, who was very, very young and um, actually the youngest person ever legally executed in the United States. And this was after the revolution. So um, even though they're not in the book, I've, there is a character very similar to, to Catherine Garrett. And Hopefully, John Stardard is someone also who was executed for murder. He was from this area, but he was executed in Hartford, and he uh, murdered a family in Bowles, in the Bowles farmhouse in 1600. So it was quite a horrific story, but sounds like something out of Stephen King, but it really did happen. So it was horrendous, but they, they did catch him, so... And this just a reminder that the death penalty itself is not ancient history. This is the Hartford Current from 2015. So only seven or eight years ago did Connecticut fully abolish for future, for all future crimes, the death penalty. All the men who were on death row were resentenced and given life sentences. So um, it just makes it feel very close to home because we, we forget that uh, 
this has really been part of Connecticut's history. And I made a few headlines myself with a story with Hart, Hartford Current and other papers that have been very interested in this, in not just a book, but the, but the history. So I've been very happy about that and telling her story, you know, and things that have been overlooked or pushed aside in, in history because just because, uh, you know, they may not be in every textbook. They certainly weren't in the textbooks that we were, that I was reading when I was in high school. So that intrigued me. So, and I think this brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, I, let's see, that would be, again, my book was published only about 10 months ago. And it's just been such a pleasure going around to libraries and historical societies and meeting people and, and people who've already read the book. So it's really been quite, quite wonderful. And the thing is, I'm learning things though all the time, but you know, it'll have to be another book. That's what I've decided, but they'll have to just simply have to be so, because just the mystery of this keeps drawing me back into it. And, you know, when I drive around town now, I know that sometimes I'm, I'm driving where Catherine Garrett was hung or somebody else. And, you know, you have to just stop and I do or pay respect to them and, and wonder, were they guilty? Were they innocent? And, um, you know, what their lives were like, very tough. So 